Hey guys, so last time when we left off, we were just discussing the regimental structure of the UNSC if they were a guard regiment. Real quickly, I want to go over all that again before jumping into the vehicles, weaponry, tactics, and the like, because this one is going to be a lot more of a information dump, I guess is the word. So I know last time I said that we were going to be basing the size of this regiment off from the Tanith first and only, and after a little bit of reflection, I've decided against that. I really do want to stick with the standard 40 to 50,000 soldiers per regiment, just so that way it's a square number and it's not too dissimilar from the rest of the Imperium. And for those of you who commented that the Imperial Guard is not a combined arms force, yes you're correct. On average, your regiments aren't combined arms, they are just riflemen corps. But this is essentially the UNSC taking the spot of Cadia. Cadia is gone, the UNSC is just going to slide right in and take their spot. So that's that out of the way. And last thing before we get started, I have to address the single most important part of this video, uh, and that is the Commissariat. Uh, literally, there's only one person in all of Halo I can see being a Commissar, and it's Sergeant Avery Johnson. There isn't a single person in all of Halo that I think could do a better job as a Commissar than Johnson. Just listen to this speech from Halo 1. Man, we let those dumb bugs out to the middle of nowhere to keep them from getting their filthy claws on Earth. But we stumbled onto something that's so hot for that they're scrambling over each other to get it. Well, I don't care if it's God's own anti-son-of-a-bitch machine or a giant hula hoop, we're not gonna let them have it. What we will let them have is a belly full of lead and a pool of their own blood to drown in. Am I right, Marines? Sir, yes, sir! So that minute or so of preambles out of the way, let's actually get into the regimental structure. So if we are having 25,000 units in this Rifleman Corps, what we're going to be doing is we're going to have 10,000 of those using LAS rifles. The entire purpose of those 10,000 troops with LAS rifles is to essentially have a never-ending barrage of LAS fire going down range, so the enemy cannot use their unarmored infantry. So we've got 10,000 troops with the LAS rifle. We are then going to have 10,000 troops with your standard 7.62.5 one round. They're probably going to be using the MA5C or some variant of that. They're probably still going to have the Magnum since that is comparable to the bolt pistol. So now that we've got 10,000 troops with the LAS rifle, 10,000 with the MA5C or whatever it is this time, the remaining 5,000 could be any mix of grenadiers or really anything that fits the role that the Kazarkin used to fill for Cadia. Alternatively, if you do have a battle zone where you don't need that many grenadiers or you don't need all the radiation, you can use those remaining 5,000 as either vehicle support, as orbital drop shock troopers, or really anything for that matter. Now, with this new 50,000 revised number, I really have to adjust the numbers of Spartans that are going to be in each one of these regiments. Uh, I really don't see it being more than 50. Anything more than that, and it is going to be way too expensive of a unit to produce. And at that rate, you may as well just form an Astartes chapter, or, you know, something below that, Proto-Astartes. So, now that we're cut down to only 50 Spartans throughout the entire 50,000 man strong regiment, we have to actually divvy it out and figure out where they are going to be most useful. Now, I might get some hate for this, but uh, I am a firm believer that they should be really doing vehicle support, artillery, or they should be weapon specialist. This case, they are either going to be the radiation specialists, or they are going to be using something similar to, like, a trebuchet or a howitzer and just shooting radioactive materials downrange. I know at face value this sounds like it would be very very dangerous, but there are ways that you can go around it that are no more different than any form of combat. For example, we're just going to say that we have blue team, black team, and white team for the Spartans. So blue team is going to be shooting essentially just giant rocks of thorium downrange. It doesn't have to be exactly thorium, but thorium is the best example in our modern day age that I can think of an example of. A lightly radioactive material that only really starts to get extremely radioactive when it's in the presence of another radioactive isotope. Add to that that it's said that there is three times as much thorium as there is uranium in the entire universe. So again, you have one or two Spartan teams whose entire job is to take these largely inert radioactive rocks, send them down range, and then you'd have one final Spartan team whose entire job is to just send canisters of cesium, uranium, plutonium, really any radioactive material that will cause a violent reaction. Within minutes of those canisters breaking open and the radioactive gas and material leaking out, 
now entire swaths of the battlefield are going to be completely uninhabitable. All of your electronics in that area are also going to stop working properly. Now, this is all assuming that all of the Spartans are going to be in lead-lined suits or some version of lead-lined SPI armor. I'm sure the Imperium or Mechanicum could come up with some solution for that, but this is where I want to bring up one of the very, very big differences in doctrine between the UNSC and the Imperial Guard. You see, the UNSC does not really like to use self-propelled artillery in the way that modern militaries or even the Imperial Guard does. What the UNSC lacks in self-propelled artillery, howitzers, and the like, they make up for for close orbital frigates. Essentially, mech cannons that are in orbit that are able to strike a position within minutes. That's not even considering that whatever ship is shooting off the mac round doesn't even need to shoot it out at full power. They can send it out just fast enough for it to get caught in the gravity well, and then by the time it reaches the surface, it's going to be at at least Mach 10. I know this is supposed to be a video on guard regiments, but it really has to be said that the UNSC doctrine of using frigates is probably not going to be adopted by the rest of the Imperium, seeing as... Essentially, broadsides are necessary for the far future where there is only war. Ships like to get in really, really close distance and just ram each other with broadsides. Add to that, the Imperium likes to just throw irreplaceable battleships at the enemy like they're just a big knife, so, you know, that's a strategy. So your two options there are either you get a super modified frigate that essentially just becomes like a light cruiser, or they're not going to be used by the rest of the Imperium because they already have ships that fill that role. That being said, I still do see the UNSC preferring the frigate approach as opposed to the ground-based artillery. Now, a lot of that goes off from the assumption that the Imperium or the UNSC would be able to find and produce tungsten, but I mean, hey, I haven't even gotten to the new form of FTL that they're going to be bringing, so, you know, here's a good segue. Uh, according to you guys, you'd prefer it if Slipspace just kind of exists. Uh, maybe it's just some undiscovered means of FTL, maybe the Necrons knew about it and they just don't feel like using it, maybe it's expensive. Who knows, the specifics aren't important, all that matters is that it works. Now, moving over to vehicles, I spent a decent amount of time thinking about the Warthog and whether it would actually fit within 40k, and yeah, I think it would. Very similar to the Bane Blade and the Land Raider Land Cruiser, basically anything that we have an STC for, the Warthog is extremely modular. Although we only see four different configurations in-game, I really don't see why it couldn't be modified very similar to the Toyota Helix in the Syrian Civil War. In-game, we've seen four different layouts for it, that being the troop transport, that being the anti-air that we saw in Halo Reach, you've got the standard machine gun that's in basically every Halo game, and then you've got the Gauss Hog, which, again, I think that one's in every game as well. Add to that, the Warthog operates on water, which is literally the third most abundant resource in the entire universe. You will never run out of fuel. Now, despite all these benefits, this is the Imperium after all, and they already have their land crawler, their land raiders, their Brunhilds, really anything that they could need, they already have. And so, realistically, the Warthog or Goff's Hog, whatever it's going to be, would be a UNSC exclusive vehicle. Yeah, maybe it's going to end up in the odd PDF force or some guard regiment, but realistically, only the UNSC would be producing them. The wider Imperium has their Forge Worlds that are making Brunhilds, they're making their different land raiders, their land crawlers. They don't need another modular light vehicle. Add to that, the Warthog doesn't have a machine spirit, and for the rest of the Imperium, that is going to be a red flag. A major red flag. If you've ever heard of the Baneblade Rin's Might, then you might actually understand the importance of machine spirits. If you don't, I really suggest you look that up, because that is one of the most metal 40k stories of all time. Now, maybe given enough time, the Mechanicus could figure out a way to shove a machine spirit into a Warthog, but I really don't think it's going to be as strong as what comes out of the STCs. Now, that also leaves a possibility of maybe the machine spirits are AI, and then, in that case, uh, I don't see why the UNSC wouldn't be using Imperium tech, because they could integrate it with their AI and use that technology better, or how it was originally supposed to be used. Now, of the 25,000 remaining soldiers, I want roughly 15,000 of them to be focused on ground-based vehicles. That being your Bane Blade, your Land Cruisers, Land Raiders, um, your Brunhilds, your Warthogs, really anything. Now, ideally, these vehicles would be used to essentially keep any opponents in the irradiated battlefield. They would not be able to escape because there would be vehicles constantly circling 
patrolling the battlefield constantly ensuring that the enemies stay in position, that they don't have an opportunity to retreat or rout themselves. And this, if you remember, from last episode I mentioned the Dark Mechanicum, this is where they come in. Because with some of the Dark Mechanicum siding with the UNSC, the UNSC would have access to scrap code, making their anti-armor and anti-vehicle stance significantly better. They can just completely disable any machinery on ground and target it with either you know, radioactive bombardment or just a Mac round from orbit. Now, you might disagree with me on this, but I don't think that Spartans should be in the air wing of realistically any engagement. I am of the opinion that once you put a super soldier into a vehicle, their effectiveness greatly diminishes. Unless, of course, you have a situation like the Iron Hands and their successors who can just pop out a tentacle and stick it into a machine and suddenly it works just as an extension of a limb. Now, being in the gunner seat, obviously a Spartan's going to be more effective, I was purely talking about piloting. That being said, all air support should be piloted by baseline humans, and they should perform roles very similar to the F-35 Lightning in the current US military arsenal. Essentially, their entire role would be for air superiority, and once this is done, they work solely on firing standoff munitions from their maximum safe distances. For this role, I'm going to be choosing the Lightning Strike Standard Issue Imperial Guard Fighter, and their support and repair crew, which honestly would take up about 50 soldiers per aircraft. While yeah, your traditional vehicle requires a lot of maintenance, aircraft specifically require exponentially more maintenance than realistically even the most complicated ground weaponry. Add to that, their entire job is speed, and because of that, they have a very low capacity for fuel and actual munitions, meaning that they have to constantly go back for refuel and resupply. That's not really a negative, it's just something I felt was pertinent and had to be mentioned. I don't know if there are any members of a flight crew out there, but you are appreciated, you are loved, you are important. Now that air superiority has been achieved, we can start using fighters like the Imperial Guard Avenger and maybe the UNSC Longsword. Realistically, you'd have the Imperial Guard Avenger who would be filling some kind of role like the A-10 Warthog who just comes in and does strafing runs. Uh, if you don't know what the A-10 is, yes you do, it is that killstreak in Call of Duty that goes... <laughs> Now, the longsword, I think, is where we could actually have the most fun, because you can just essentially fill that cargo hole up with radioactive material, fly it over the enemy, and just coat them in radiation. You don't even have to drop bombs on them, you can just drop liquid uranium on them. Not only would this liquefy basically anyone within a five mile radius, but any and all communications and electronics are also going to fail. Anything that the scrap code didn't get before is going to stop working now, for sure. So where does that leave us? We basically just replaced the Cadians, but Cadia doesn't exist anymore and the galaxy is a very different place, so we can't have them just be holding down the Eye of Terror. They get to have a really, really fun, unique use. And that would be either some sort of subsidiary underneath the Death Watch or the Ordo Zeno, or they would act as an anti-Tau regiment. Yeah, I know that the UNSC is in the far galactic west and the Tau are in the far galactic right, but hey, slipspace works, so I mean, they'll get there eventually. Oddly enough, I can also see them working as an anti-insurrection or a peacekeeper force for that matter. This is essentially a group of humans who is coming from a universe where they understand humanity to such a point where we have people like Dr. Carver who with math and psychology are able to definitively prove when insurrections are going to happen. If this was implemented on the wider scale throughout the Imperium, we could save billions if not quadrillions of lives every year just to infighting. Now, the best case scenario for the UNSC in this situation is a vassal state or a tributary. Very, very similar to what happened with the Cult Mechanicum that was given almost complete autonomy as long as they produce weapons and war gear for the expanding Imperium, resurrected silly man in this situation would just tell them to sign the dotted line and to keep a steady supply of troop transports full to the brim ready for a war zone near you. All of this, however, does rely on Bobby G not knowing about the AI situation, some AI like Serana or someone on her level could more than likely convince your average tech adept that they are a fully intact machine spirit, but Gilliman is a completely different story. We know for a fact that he reacted pretty poorly to Call's frequent use of simulated minds, so any situation where a UNSC machine seems more competent than a Call inferior, it is going to result in some kind of an exterminatus. Now's the time for a curveball. I actually think the lion finding the UNSC is the best case scenario. 
since the lion has the ability to sense some kind of warp taint, I can see an actually really nice first meeting between the Angel of Caliban and either Sergeant Johnson or Jerome of Red Team. Seeing as Halo doesn't have any psychic abilities or any latent psychers really anywhere within the setting, the Lion would have no reason not to trust them or take their word that they are just a lost sect of humanity from the Dark Age. Realistically, the UNSC should look like what dozens of other human empires looked like during the Great Crusade, and the Lion should remember that. Now, this isn't saying that the Lion isn't aware of AI or that he wouldn't freak out about it, it's more so that the Lion has less exposure to it. He hasn't really been introduced to Belisarius' call, and so he doesn't really know what modern uses of artificial intelligence would look like. If the Lion saw a situation where some terminally ill person was given seven extra years of life by uploading them digitally, the Lion might actually just see that as some kind of minor life extension or some way of getting all of the information out of their brain. But realistically, Papa Smurf is going to see one picked of Cortana's feet, and the entire system that the UNSC resides in is going to experience what a virus bomb is and be shown up close and personal why the Gloriana class battleship is so damn cool. I just don't see a situation where Gilliman doesn't recognize the AI for what it is. I want to end this off with probably the biggest culture shock that the UNSC would experience by joining the Imperial Guard, and that is the lack of men returning. The UNSC comes from a time where being a soldier, while yes, it's important, yes, it's a career, it is just a job. In the Guard, being a Guardsman is a lifestyle. There isn't going to be a time where you aren't fighting for your survival. According to the UNSC, any kind of victory, no matter what the cost, no matter what, it is a victory and it should be celebrated. With the Imperium, if your UNSC regiment just so happened to see demons, congratulations, you just lost 50,000 innocent men and women, and you are going to have to put another regiment forward for your tithe. To quote Commissar Yarick's uncle, The guard is never done with you, boy. And within a few generations of essentially nobody coming back from deployment, I can see the UNSC becoming just as jaded as the rest of the Imperium. Realistically, now that I'm done with this situation, all I see is a situation where the UNSC slowly degrades over centuries until the point where it's just as brutal of a regime as the rest of the Imperium. And the reality of it is, that's a lot less dangerous. A jaded group of humanity fighting to barely stay alive is a lot better than a very zealous group of humanity who's pissed off at another group of humanity and is capable of starting a massive civil war. So there it is. Your two outcomes are either there's a civil war and the UNSC just gets absolutely smacked, or we have a situation where the UNSC just becomes so jaded and so disgusting that they are the rest of the Imperium. That's it. Hey, thank you guys for watching. Now, I know I've never personally asked for subs, but my friend Uncle Sam Lore is really, really close to hitting 5k. If you could, go over there, show him some love. He's a really, really awesome guy, and he deserves 5k. But thank you guys for watching.